I'm going to tell you a little of how the Lord saved me. I was brought up in Manchester. I was brought up in the slums of Manchester. Sadly, I came from the depths of the slums of Moss Side. Moss Side is infamous in our land today. I tell you, it was no different when I was there. Except they didn't have the guns in those days, just the knives, you know. And whatever else it might suit them, as they wanted to gain their own way in life. My father was a drunkard, poor fellow. The sad thing is, my mother was a drunkard too. And I came from a drunken home. I have very, very vivid recollections of it. One of my older brothers, he said to me, can you still remember it? I said, Phil, I could never forget it. For when you've got a, a large, gaunt, Victorian house, next door a bond house, the houses across the road, all bond houses, the bond house is my playground. When you went up to the top story of the three-story house and you find uh, there was a great big wall that literally went through into the bond house next door, you're living in a pretty rough house. We had a lounge. There was nothing in it at all. Just bare floorboards. There was a cupboard in it. I remember going to it one day to try and get some food. Hope there might be some food there. There was literally a crust of bread. And as I opened the cupboard door, I suddenly saw the mouse scurrying away as quick as it could, down into a hole. But it just left me a little piece of that crust of bread. I want to tell you, if he came back looking, he didn't find any. Because that crust of bread was as much to me as it was to him. And I was just as happy to eat it. I would have eaten the apple cores that I found in the street. But sadly, my mother never made us a meal. My mother just didn't care for these kids. And uh, at night time, we would literally be sat on the doorstep of that house, frightened to go inside. Thinking again of all the evils that might have been in it, the ghosts and the like, you know, when you're just a little fellow. When mother and father and brothers that were older, all out at the pub or wherever they got to. This was the kind of home that we were brought up in. They don't pray with you there, you know. They don't give you the gospel there. They don't send you to church there. You're just left to do what you will there. To get my food, I literally had to go down and steal it. Poor lady in the shop just round the corner. I can see it every time I came in. She said to one man one day, keep your eye on that boy, he's a thief. But I was only stealing to live, you know. She had some very good cakes there. And when her back was turned, well, she might suddenly found she was a cake or two short. And just a little bit further down the other way was the bakery. And I tell you, I always used to go every day when I saw those men pushing the, the things out to fill up the lorries. And as, again, as soon as their backs were turned, there was a loaf missing. No butter, of course. But that doesn't matter when you're hungry, does it? As long as you can fill your stomach, that's all that matters. We were brought up very, very carelessly. I never forget the bed we slept in. And I remember going to it one night. My mother never taught me to go to the toilet in the middle of the night. That bed was just a sodden mattress. No sheets, no pillowcases, just old coats thrown over the top of it. Beer would rob everybody of anything within their home, you know. And ruin their lives, sadly. And maybe there's some man here today, some woman here today. And you're robbing your families for your own sinful pleasure. And you need God's salvation. But it's only God's salvation that will change you, let me tell you. You need Christ tonight. But it's only Christ that transforms lives. And you'll never break the power by yourself. You're going to need the power that the gospel brings and God brings when he makes you a new creature when you get saved. I was growing up to be a little criminal. But I'm very, very thankful from that home in which I have a brother that was a professional boxer, fought the British champion. My father was a professional boxer. But from that home, my brothers that have been in prison. I'll go no further, dear friend. For this is the only way that that kind of life can bring you. I'm very thankful today that I'm a preacher of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm very thankful I'm eternally saved. When I went out to be a preacher of the gospel at 33 years of age, I went back to that street, Fairlawn Street, I went back to number 27. I stood outside 
and I just bowed my head. And I thank God that from that place, God was now taking me up to use me to preach the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus. And I just thank God for what God had done in my life. When I was ten years old, my father left my mother. He did what folks didn't do in those days. He went to live with another woman. There was a measure of morality in our land then. People weren't careless about their morals before God as they are today. When people think they can sin with impunity and get away with it, adultery is still adultery. And it's one of the things that God's going to cast men into hell for. Let me tell you, it was a very serious thing. In the 1940s, if the neighbours had known, my father and mother would have been the offscouring of the earth. For it was something that nobody ever did. But she'd been an old childhood sweetheart. Her sister had married my father's brother. She was just as immoral as the rest. She was expecting another baby when her husband had died, expecting it to another man. I, they did those things then too. And when my father went to visit his brother, he suddenly came across this woman that he'd once been engaged to. And here she was in need as she was carrying a child. She needed a man to cover her sin. At least they wanted to cover their sin then. They weren't so blatant about it, you know. As a result of it, my father went to live with her in the south of Manchester, a place called Withenshaw. I never missed father. He was a long-distance lorry driver. We only ever saw him at weekend. And when I saw him, he was usually flat out in a chair. He drunk himself silly. And he was usually just fast asleep in a chair. I can hardly ever remember uh, my father doing anything other than sleep in a chair and go down to the pub. And one day my mother called me in and she said to me, Norman, do you want to stay here or do you want to go and live with your father? No, I didn't know. I had no choice. There was no social security in those days. My mother couldn't go down to the uh, DHSS or whatever they are, you know. And she was putting me and my little sister out. My little sister was just four years old. Sorry, six years old. I was ten. She's four years younger than me. We came and took a bus down to the south of Manchester and we came to this corporation house down in Withenshaw. A great transformation. We came to a house that was spotlessly clean. We came to a house that had got sheets and pillowcases and blankets. We came to a house that had got a dinner on the table. We came to a house where a lady could cook and a lady was absolutely spotless in everything she did. The only sad thing is, she had two slum children thrown at her. And she didn't want those slum children. She had to have them. My father had to take the consequences of us. And uh, we went into that house. The next years were very, very bitter years. I, she taught me to wear my clothes properly. It would have had a crease in. Everything would have been spotlessly clean, from top to bottom. But I want to tell you, they were bitter years, as that woman used to vent her anger on these two kids that she just didn't want. They talk today about lads putting the boot in, don't they? I knew that many a time. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. As she'd beat you to the floor, and in would go the boot, and in would go the boot, as she would scream at you. I used to wet the bed, you see. She wouldn't let me drink after, after I came home from school. I used to go to the school washrooms and, uh, and take my last drink before I came home. But when I wet the bed, I'd been drinking that night. I hadn't drunk. You're a liar. And it would start. If you put the wrong clothes on, it would start. If you looked the wrong way, it would start. If there was a hell on earth and there isn't, no matter what you're going through, that was it. There's one thing she did do. She sent us to a gospel hall. No, she wasn't religious. Just like maybe some of you folks. Perhaps you've sent your children to the gospel hall too, and you're not saved. Get them out of the way for Sunday afternoon, that seemed to be the way. Many folks went on a Sunday, and we went to the little gospel hall. I started to hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I went till I was twelve. When I was 12, I discovered that you could earn money caddying on a, a golf course not too far away. 
And the laddie next door, he asked us if we'd go with him caddying. We went, I didn't know what it was all about, but we went, we got a job. And I don't think I ever came off that golf course for the next four years. Every Saturday, every Sunday, during the week, cleaning clubs at the golf course, just living at the golf course, earning money, bringing it home, mother was happy with that. But in those four years, I became atheistic. I came to believe there couldn't be a God. If there's a God, why this? I hear it all the time, you know. People telling me, if there's a God, why is the world like it is? The fault's not with God. The fault, friend, is with you, and the fault is with me. That's where the fault lies. Don't be blaming God for your own folly and for the effects of it as it touches society, which is a lot of hypocrites, you know. And we blame God for what is our own fault. But I was just the same. If there's a God, why this kind of a life? Little boy, being beaten constantly. To the tune that when I was about 14, I literally stood at the corner of a road, ready to throw myself into the road when a bus came. Thought I'd just finished with it all. Weeping night after night on the pillow. I tell you, friends, sad lives. And if God's given you children, you look after them now. And you care for them. When I came to leave school, I went to work with a firm where I discovered that the boss of that department was a Christian. Everybody knew he was a Christian. I used to say I could tell he was a Christian because he was the most miserable creature I ever saw in my life. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't gamble, he didn't swear. Miserable? A clean life where he lived for God, let me tell you. But I thought of this poor miserable little creature. Didn't go to the works dance, didn't do anything. Just stuck in his little corner. Mind you, he didn't tell me that I needed a saviour either. He didn't give me a gospel tract. But his life was there, and every time you saw him, God, God, God. I never forget one day, I walked into that department, and as I walked into the department, a little atheist, convinced there was no God, having debated against God in school, as I came through the door, something suddenly said to me, what if there's a God? I'm convinced it's because Mr. Heathcote was there. And as this thing struck me, I suddenly said, turned around in my own mind and said, looking heavenward, no such a thing. Well then again the voice came back again, but what if there is a God? Fifteen and a half years of age. How old are you folks? If you're able to get saved, and you need to get saved, fifteen and a half, if there's a God, there's a heaven, if there's a God, there's a hell, and if there's a God, you are going to hell. Now that wasn't a preacher. Nobody was pointing the Bible at me. I was just walking through a factory. Maybe things I'd learned in the Sunday school, I don't know. But if there's a God, there's a heaven, and if there's a God, there's a hell. And I didn't need preachers to tell me that my life was such that I wouldn't be going to heaven, friend. Listen, if there's a God tonight, will you be honest? You know full well, don't you? If there's a God, you're going to hell. And as I kept walking, but I was walking, the same thing said, and if there's a God, son, you'd better do something about it. I did. I went back to that little gospel hall. I started to listen to the preaching. Do you know what I heard? I heard all about the coming of the Lord Jesus, and I didn't know when he was coming. I heard that when the Lord Jesus came, the first thing he's going to do is take Christians out of this world and take them up to heaven in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. There's going to be a mighty change takes place, and they'll be going to call it away. We're not looking for death, friend. We're looking for the Lord Jesus to come. And then I'd learned this from those men. Once the Christians have been taken out of the world, because you see, God's got no no argument with them. Their argument was settled at Calvary. They trusted Christ, and Christ took their judgment, so there's no judgment for them. And one day, Bister is going to be emptied of those that belong to Christ. For the Lord's going to come, and the Christians are going to be caught up home, heavenward. And my dear friend, if you're not saved, you're going to be left behind. And I heard it all. For the tribulation, the judgment of God, as he's going to pour his wrath out upon this world. My dear friend, an awesome day that's going to dawn. And I believe that day is not far away. No man knows the day nor the hour. Again, Matthew 24, therefore be also ready. 
For in such an hour as you think not, just when you think he won't come, that's when the Christ of God is going to start these great events. He started to trouble me. I don't know that it troubles you. I got concerned. My mother and father wouldn't have gone to the glory if the Lord Jesus came. My brothers and sisters wouldn't have gone to the glory if the Lord Jesus came. I would never have known. I used to get down to that gospel hall early and I tell you I was so thankful if I saw some of those men from the gospel hall I knew that Christ hadn't come. I knew I ought to get saved. But I wanted to save myself, you know. I wanted the destiny of my world in my hands. I wasn't prepared to commit it to Christ. But the more I went to the gospel, the more I realised I needed Jesus Christ. i never forget the day. It was March the 17th, 1951. Fifty years ago this year. Some folks say you'll never keep it up. Well, you can't keep it up. But let me tell you, when you get to Christ, he never fails you. And he'll never let you down. But it's the Lord that saves, not me. It's the Lord that saves, not you. Salvation is of the Lord. And when he saves you, he'll save you for eternity. When he saves you, he'll give you eternal life. And my dear friend, you can never perish. And 50 years ago, March the 17th, I bowed my knees to Christ. Saturday morning, my mother took all my wages. So apart from going to the golf course, I also delivered newspapers. And this Saturday morning, I was just going out to deliver the newspapers. I was just a month short of my 16th birthday. But I remember getting up that morning, and my dear friend, there was one thing rolling through my mind. What if the Lord comes? Well, I knew enough to know if the Lord came, the Christians were being caught away to the glory, and I was going to be left for the wrath of God when it was poured out upon ungodly men. And what's more, I knew I deserved it. I remember going to the back door. And as I went to the back door and lifted the, uh, unbolted the door and lifted the latch, somebody said to me very loudly, What if the Lord comes? I went up and I looked up towards heaven. And I thought, if the Lord comes, I'm damned. Damned. I wasn't saved, you see. I picked up my bicycle. And I was just about to get on the bicycle to ride around the path and out to, to deliver the newspapers, when again, what if the Lord comes? And I thought, I can't delay with this business any longer. I've got to get saved. I put the bike down. I went back into the house. I just knelt by a little kitchen chair. And I asked the Christ of God to do for me what he came into the world to do. For the Bible says he came into the world to save sinners. And as a poor sinner, I asked the Lord Jesus to save me. Do you know something? Before I got off my knees, I knew I was saved. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And a little boy from the slums. Beaten, battered and broken. Bless God. He didn't cast me out. He took me in. He saved my precious soul. And can I tell you, before I got off my knees, I knew I was saved. I went out of the house. And as I picked up the latch again, the same thing came and said, Norman, what if the Lord comes? And I went out. And I looked to the sky. And I thought, if the Lord comes, I'm going to the glory. You see, in a moment, I trusted Christ, and it just takes a moment to get saved. What if the Lord comes, friend? Are you saved? You need to be saved. Because the God will save you.